Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel. And this one is going in the AAS Journal Author Series. And I am super happy to have Charles Romero with us here today. Hi, Charles. Hello. How you doing? Doing well. Where are you that has such uh, pretty trees and woods behind you? I am with family in Southern Virginia. Southern Virginia, OK. Very good. Very good. Uh, so are things things opening up uh, this fall uh, at your institution? Yeah, so I'm currently at the Green Bank Observatory oh, in West okay. Virginia, yeah. and an interesting position there. I'm a postdoc, but split time at, with the University of Pennsylvania. Um, okay. So down in Virginia, while while you're required to be away from the office. Right. Um, Got it. Yeah, so, things are opening up at the observatory, stepping through in phases. Okay. Can, so we'll see. Can it operate in a completely robotic mode? Well, there's a telescope operator that has to be there, but okay. effectively during the height of the pandemic, it was a very skeletal crew, mm -hmm. but it remained operational throughout. Okay. So cool. That was fantastic. Very cool. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. So what do you like to do for research, Charles? So uh, starting in grad school, I've got interested in the Sanyev Zoldovich effect, and that's primarily dealing with clusters of galaxies. Uh, so that is my primary area of research. And as the instruments are getting better, I'm more and more interested in the physics within galaxy clusters. OK, awesome. And that'll lead us very nicely into this lovely paper. So I'm going to do a screen share with folks. And we are going to talk about pressure profiles and mass estimates using high resolution uh, Sunyaev Zeldovich effect observations of Zwicky 3146 with Mustang 2. And Charles, take us away. Yeah. So this is one of the first uh, papers to come out from Mustang 2, in particular, observing clusters of galaxies. And one thing that really is notable about our observations of Zwicky 3146 relative to other clusters we've observed is that we've gone a lot deeper on this cluster than other ones. Okay. And so that just gives us a very nice test bed to look at the capabilities of Mustang II. Um, and some of what we'll get to, I think, much later, especially the appendix, will be a comparison of how we process our data. But more saliently with science, uh, we want to see how well we can do for estimating the mass of the cluster, since that is uh, a very fundamental quantity of interest Certainly, it could be for cosmology and how galaxy clusters get used in cosmology, but also towards physics within galaxy clusters. OK. So that's uh, really the thrust of the papers, looking at some mass estimates that we get uh, and toying around with different ways to get mass estimates cool. and then comparing it to the literature. Uh, with that, um, I don't know if you think we need to go over a primer of the C effect or how many people are. Uh, well, these, this series is for uh, active researchers, um, so, so it's okay to go hardball astronomy, uh, but then not necessarily everyone will uh, be a galaxy person. For example, we may have some exoplanet folks uh, listening in uh, just to learn a little bit more about galaxies. So maybe just a little bit of a primer on what the SC effect is and how you use it would be good. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. So the SC effect actually can be broken down into multiple effects, but broadly it's the inverse Compton scattering of cosmic microwave background photons. Oh. So you just need free electrons and really energetic free electrons. Uh, then the primary SC effect that people think about, at least myself, is the thermal SC effect, 
okay. uh, which is to say the distribution of your electrons is thermally distributed. Uh, and in that case, you can write in equation one, uh, a Compton Y parameter that's proportional to the integrated electron pressure along the line of sight. Um, but for instance, you have a kinematic SD effect if the entire cluster is moving towards or away from you. And then there are even more subtle uh, SC effects that are proposed, but uh, the strength of those signals is such that by and large right now we can't observe them. So uh, I'll have questions uh, since you bring up the thermal SD. Um, so what part of equation one is measured, right? Uh, effectively, okay, so Compton Y, if you scale it by another factor that depends on the frequency that you're observing at and a minor correction for the electron temperature, as, as you get really hot, your distribution is not uh, the standard Maxwellian one. So you have a relativistic correction. Mm -hmm. um, so simply put, there's just a constant factor that we can multiply that y by, and that's on the sky. So, you know, you could say y is a function of uh, your vector theta. Um, on okay. The sky. I'm with you. So we're measuring y. Effectively, you're, you're measuring y. Okay. Um, I guess, obviously, smoothed by your beam. Okay. Very good. All right. Um, well, yeah, let's uh, go ahead and look at figure one. Um, the, oh, that's a lot of mass estimates. Yeah, we can, well, let's go with figure one real quick since uh, <laughs> we're on the subject of what are we measuring? Um, so a bit there is just how one observes with a continuum instrument, uh, especially on the ground. Uh, perfect. So the upper panel shows a scan trajectory for Mustang 2, in particular one that we would have used for this cluster. Uh, so the black lines are the scan trajectory and the dashed lines are field of view. So the blue one is for Mustang 2, which we use for this data set. And M1 refers to Mustang 1, which was the predecessor instrument. Okay. Uh, and so the point then is we want to basically scan on and off source so that we're doing a differencing measurement. And effectively, that way we can subtract out the atmosphere that's contributing uh. the the bulk of the signal that you actually see. If you just made a map of the raw data without any processing, it would be a map of the Earth's atmosphere. Right. <laughs> so, so the point then is, uh, you know, even if you do some tricks to get rid of the atmosphere, the simplest one is to calculate what's called a common mode across your detectors and subtract that out. Uh, but then you end up with some ringing effect. You subtract off, I mean, not just the mean level, but yeah, you get a ringing and you don't get the intrinsic astronomical signal that way. Um, so yeah, uh, there's definitely a fair bit of work to get in the map that you want of the cluster. Okay. And just in the lower panel here, we show that effectively the noise that we get out with two different processing pipelines, which are called Minkasi and Midas, uh, are very much similar. Mm -hmm. so, uh, that's noise temperature. Okay. Yes, I'm with you. Right. And there are a variety of ways, or there are two common units used in millimeter astronomy, such as what we use for Mustang 2. Um, you could use Jansky's per beam, or uh, Calvin is a bit more of a traditional radio astronomer term. Right. And this actually uses 
a Kelvin in Rayleigh genes sense a normal radio astronomer Kelvin. Um, yep. You do also uh, see Kelvin CMB, which is a bit more common for SC studies, but uh, we have the correction for Kelvin to Kelvin CMB included in our calculations when we go to Compton Y. All right. Um, I think that's good for an observational overview. We can go back to the table briefly. That was up. Uh, yep. Table one. So, so this was uh, pulled up as much uh, as I could find the masses in the literature. And uh, well, they don't always have uh, the mass given at the same uh, density contrast that we might be interested in using nowadays. Right. So masses for galaxy clusters are typically given at density contrasts of 2,500 to, or 500 and 200. And that's with respect to, or that's the mean density within a radius of the galaxy cluster relative to the critical density of the universe. Mm -hmm. uh, or at least it probably would be better to add a subscript C there for critical density. You could also compare it to the mean matter density. Um, so they're differing uh, normalizations. Subtleties of what you're going after with those two. Um, but we primarily focus on M500 here. So if the literature didn't cite it in M500, we provide a crude uh, scaling to M500, which is not particularly precise, but is sufficient just to understand where that uh, literature mass estimate falls with respect to other ones. Mm -hmm. And you see, basically, I would say anything before the 2000s, which parsing the years uh, might take a little bit longer, or actually, sorry, 2010, uh, you can get a pretty big range of mass estimates. And also, well, fortunately, they do also have some correspondingly large error bars. Uh, later, there's a, a plot which shows mass estimates with uh, comparatively good error uh, or uncertainties on them, but you still see there's a fair bit of scatter compared to the error bars that are reported. So. Okay. Uh, yeah, but that that list of masses also helps build our intuition for what we expect to get out um, with Mustang. Yes. <clears throat> OK. Let's see. Where would you like to go next? Let's hop back. Well, going in line, we can go to figure two. Um, Okay, let's blow that up a little bit. Okay. All right. So there are, uh, well, there's our map that we get with Mustang 2, and then uh, it has a zoom in in the middle and right. Uh, so left panel just shows you uh, what we were able to construct with the Minkasi pipeline. Uh, and it still has some point sources in there. It was kind of interesting to find two kind of elliptical looking sources. Yep. Uh, but it turns out when you look at uh, first data, there are actually listed two point sources that are very much very close to each other, such that it almost looks like one elliptical compact source. Uh, but 
they're well modeled with the positions given by first as point sources. Uh, so then we can subtract those out fairly easily, um, especially when they're not right at the same centroid as your galaxy cluster. Uh, and then we're one in the middle panel, we're interested in just seeing, is there any substructure that seems to be evident in the SC signal? And maybe there is a little bit, um, but it's not too uh, pronounced there. Right. And then in the far right panel, we're just uh, comparing uh, with uh, Chandra in the far right one to see the detail in the core. Is there some feature that Chandra sees and we don't? Um, so. Then uh, okay. the next figure three is looking at uh, the geometry or how ellipsoidal our cluster is. And we do this basically with isophotes uh, going out in radius. And you see that in the center, there is some ellipticity, uh, but as you go further and further out, it looks rather spherical, which is good because the intention with this analysis, like many galaxy cluster analyses, is to assume spherical symmetry. And while you certainly could do uh, ellipsoidal analyses, and that's quite easy for just projecting uh, a profile and understanding what your pressure profile would be, it's a little bit, it's definitely more complicated when you're trying to get a mass out. Yes. <laughs> so uh, we're happy to see that it's sufficient to assume spherical symmetry here. So what are the highlight differences between Midas and uh, Minkasi? Yeah, so probably about time that we get into that. Uh, Midas is effectively your standard pipeline in that it takes an approach along the lines of a common mode. Uh, nowadays, we tend to use a principal component analysis. Okay. We have anywhere from three to six components that we subtract out. Uh -huh. uh, but the primary one is effectively that common mode. Uh, and then just because of electronics or other factors, you might expect to have a few other components that really are not astronomical signal and you want to take out. Got it. Uh, and then Minkasi is, rather than trying to find uh, a signal that you don't want and subtract it out, it wants to look in the time streams and model your noise in Fourier domain. Okay. And then fit some model in that time space or Fourier space. and. Uh, so Minkasi has two kind of things we can do with it. We can make a map where, in essence, each pixel is uh, an element that you're solving for. But with how many pixels you want to solve for, you can't uh, fit that exactly. You need to do a preconditioned conjugate gradient. Okay. Or if you have a, a simpler model, uh, so here for a spherical symmetric cluster, we did rings. That's easy enough to write down what the model is and solve for that. Uh, and then we get out uh, an exact error bar too at the very end. Uh, right. Uh -huh. so. Okay, cool, thanks. Yep. Uh, and I guess while we're here, um, the, the Minkasi map shown in figure two, it's, oh, go up, yeah. Uh, the nice thing compared to a Midas map, which I think somewhere in the appendix is a Midas map, um, or there's certainly a profile in the appendix, but the Minkasi recovers the astronomical signal out to much larger radii. So that's, 
one of the driving factors to using Minkasi is that you don't have to subtract that common mode and you can in fact recover larger scales. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We'll hit on that again a bit later. Okay. All okay. right, actually, perfect. Figure four, we can hit on it again. Um, okay, so this is a recovered pressure profile uh, from the Minkasi data. And here I'm showing you uh, two different models used for the SC data, that being the green curve and the blue dots. So green is generalized NFW, which is a nice uh, parametric model. Uh, so it's smooth. And then the non-parametric just takes a power law interpolation between the points shown uh, on that plot. Uh -huh. And you extend it into zero and infinity, uh, which works out that you can uh, integrate that a power law uh, analytically. So that is one reason you're able to integrate out to infinity that way. And then we're comparing to a pressure profile that's derived from XMM data. So we see that there is agreement between, well, SC and X-ray, but more generically, just the two models in SC uh, gener generally agree with each other and with X-ray. Yep. Uh, then what I have plotted uh, vertically here the red dash lines show the radial full width half max, so okay, half width half max, and the radial field of view or field of view over two. And then the black dash line shows R500 that we get for this cluster. So canonically, or let me just specify a bit more. By field of view, I mean the instantaneous field of view. And canonically, uh, instruments like Mustang, those uh, continuum instruments on a single dish, cannot recover scales beyond their instantaneous field of view. But what we're seeing with uh, that pressure profile is that it sure looks like we're doing a good job of recovering scales beyond our instantaneous field of view. Mm hmm yes. Yes. So definitely. That is very encouraging for us and uh, allows us to get mass estimates for M500 rather than just say M2500, which would be right. a smaller radius. Yes. Okay. So estimates. Uh, so we, we've done the non-parametric and parametric uh, pressure profiles there just to see how good of agreement they are because the generalized NFW profile is a fairly common parameterization nowadays. Uh, certainly, you still see beta models. Uh, those were quite common uh, a decade or more ago, but they're still very useful. Um, and so it's just always nice to check that that parameterization is, I would say, still valid. Um, and I would say one would very much expect it to be valid for this cluster. It is a cool core cluster um, and it's characteristics are not too different from uh, many of the cluster samples that have been used to generate, uh, say, standard parameters within the GNFW profile. Okay. 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 So I think we can move on then to uh, yeah, so table two. Yeah.
So, all right. There are uh, effectively five different mass estimates that we get uh, at M500, and we do the same for M2500, and then we play that game just between the two different pressure profiles. Uh, one would not expect the masses to be too different between the two profiles. Right. So then the first three that are listed in that table, the columns, are masses that come from a YM relation. So I've glossed over YM relations in the text, but a capital Y is a volumetric integral of that little y. So, okay. well, a volumetric integral of the pressure, right? The little y was pressure along the line of sight. Correct. So if you're integrating pressure over a volume, that's proportional to total thermal energy, if it's thermal pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, and so to the extent that your entire pressure support is thermal, you should expect that uh, quantity to be very closely linked to total mass. Or said in another way, if your system is completely under hydrostatic equilibrium, that should be an excellent agreement. Yes. That said, it, it definitely depends on the sample you use and how you've calibrated the sample. So we're using YM relations in the literature. Um, and I don't think it's too important. Well, they're listed there in the uh, caption, which ones they are. Um, but yeah, they all establish their masses in different ways. So. YM1 established their mass effectively assuming hydrostatic equilibrium and using an X-ray scaling relation. Okay. The second one used weak lensing data for the masses uh, and had an SC instrument to establish their uh, integrated Y. Okay. And then the third one was based on simulations, numerical simulations. Okay. So it's, uh, there are a lot of numbers to parse here. We don't, uh, well, the error bars are in order statistical, then a YM systematic, and then a calibration error, uh, our end um, calibration error for the YM numbers. For the last two, uh, columns, the error bars are statistical and uh, a systematic calibration uncertainty again. Okay. But uh, I think it's a bit too much to try to parse all those numbers right here and just focus on the expected value for the different uh, means of calculating mass. And you see that YM1 and YM3 tend to be pretty close to each other, but YM2 is uh, generally lower than the other two. Mm -hmm. And more than that, then the M underscore HE, the hydrostatic equilibrium mass, uh, is also in pretty good agreement with YM1 and YM3. Yes. And just to be sure, the hydrostatic equilibrium we use our pressure profile from SC, and we use an electron density profile from X-ray data, XMM. Okay. And we assume a, a standard uh, metallicity to go between electron density and mass density. Uh, baryonic mass density. The last uh, mass estimate we have here is uh, subscripted with VT for virial theorem. So it assumes a virial theorem and it also assumes a NFW uh, matter profile. And the 
the way to go about that is set in the text that comes from a paper from Tony Marchowski, I think 2011. And so it's just an interesting alternative way to calculate uh, a mass. But uh, interesting enough, the M500 values are biased high compared to our other estimates. Mm -hmm. um, figure five and six just show uh, residuals from our data once we've subtracted off a fitted uh, cluster profile. So, and the contours there on figure five show two sigma. So mm -hmm. there really isn't too much significant substructure. I think the most evident thing is a bit of a quadrupole, which is readily explained by uh, having some ellipsoidal geometry towards the center, if you remember from figure three, I think it was. Yes. Okay. Uh, there are some triangle points that denote uh, known point sources in there, and the red cross is the centroid that we assume. Okay. Uh, and blue is, uh, there's a weakly detected source in Herschel, which perhaps is a match to a blip we see there, but it's low significance. Okay. Uh, then I think we can go on beyond pressure profiles and see what else we can do. Because we have x-ray data, we can investigate other thermodynamic uh, profiles and things of interest. So, yep, yeah, we can go to the next figure. Uh, there we go. So, uh, one thing that I think SC has a fair bit of uh, prospects for contributing greatly to cluster science is that in tandem with, say, uh, electron densities from X-ray measurements, and you're getting pressure from SC, you can recover a temperature profile or maybe even a temperature map, depending on how sophisticated you want to get. And you can do this in a lot less time than what you would need solely from x-ray to get the spectroscopic x-ray temperatures. Uh, all right, so here what we want to do is just look at what are the temperatures that we would get from such an analysis and compare it to the spectroscopic x-ray temperature. Those are shown in green, uh, and the SC temperatures are effectively the blue and red curves, um, and the shaded region denotes their one sigma error bars. Uh, there are, there's a black dot dash line, a uh, curve, and that's just showing you a standard or maybe I shouldn't say standard, but kind of an average temperature profile uh, that comes from this Ficklin and 06 paper. And so, I mean, the temperature shape we see is not extremely different from that average shape. I would say it's within expectation, expected deviation from that. Okay. Um, All right, I think we can go on to figures eight and nine. Okay. Eight and nine. There we go. All right, so then beyond the uh, temperature, uh, Entropy or an entropy proxy is often of interest. Uh, there's an expectation that uh, that entropy profile will B 
be very much a parallel until deep within the core and then uh, really outside your virial radius or at your virial radius, you would expect it to flatten again. And uh, an average uh, slope for that profile is 1.1, but we seem to be finding a steeper slope uh, for both our pressure profiles. I think the most interesting thing that we're finding is that it seems to be turning over a bit early. That is, that uh, dotted line is R2500 and dashed line is R500. And so we do not expect it to be turning over that early. Okay. And in the appendix, we look into, is this some kind of systematic? Because yeah. ultimately, uh, we are still attempting to get a pressure profile almost twice uh, our instantaneous field of view. Mm -hmm. So it's very much conceivable that there is a systematic that crept in even though our pressure profile looks good. Um, and so then figure nine is showing you a gas fraction, which is again another, well, it's something of interest, but here I've taken it almost a bit more as a, another check on our uh, recovered pressure profile. So we would not expect our gas fraction to go above uh, the universal gas fraction, right, which is effectively omega baryon over omega matter. Um, and let's see, the top panel there, in order to get a mass profile for those curves there, I've assumed an NFW profile from the masses that I got from the YM relations at R2500 and R500. Whereas the lower panel is assuming the hydrostatic equilibrium, so you have a mass profile directly from that. Okay. Hmm. All right. So then I think we can go on to figure 10, which is a bit one of the main figures for me anyways. And it should be big. OK. So here we're showing uh, the mass estimates for, quote, well, um, well constrained clusters, which is really just Anytime they reported uncertainties less than 20%, we've included them, which ends up being basically the, the more recent uh, publications. So then I've also color coded them based on uh, the, the wavelength that the measurement is coming from effectively. And I would say that we expect X-ray and SC to agree very closely, just because they're both looking at the intracluster medium and making the same assumptions. Sure, there are different sensitivities um, between X-ray and SC, yep. but again, the underlying assumptions should be the same. Eight. And then the weak lensing measurements, there were only two uh, that met that criterion, they are actually very recent uh, measurements. It's interesting to see this one that's bias low. Um, yeah. That that paper actually, or their sample is on average in good agreement with the overlapping sample from that other weak lensing data point. But somehow for this one cluster, they seem to have gotten a, a different uh, mass. Yes, about a factor two-ish. Right. Uh, and then it's uh, not too surprising, but some a lot of these 
error bars in the literature are just statistical and they don't include any systematic. So I would take that one x-ray point which has the smallest error bar and just note that <laughs> right. that looks rather suspicious. Um, and well, it's actually something even I kind of find myself on, in my data that when I'm a, assuming a GNFW profile, the error bars get smaller, right? Because assuming that shape automatically, artificially uh, reduces your errors. And so I, I think that's very much the same case. When you assume your profile, you get artificially smaller error bars. And it's just worth being cautious uh, about what those error bars actually end up being. Right. Very nice plot. Yeah. So uh, the points that are coming from Mustang 2, I've included basically the statistical error bar is the first uh, notch you see. Okay. And then when you add in the systematic errors, you get the big error bar. All right. So, um, right, that's a nice plot to show good agreement with the literature, um, especially if you fold in some additional error bars for sy systematic errors that weren't accounted for or reported. Um, and if, if we ignore the one low weak lensing mass and compare to the other one that's in agreement, uh, that gets into a bit, well, the direction uh, of studies that I'd like to take SC, be it for this cluster, but also for other ones, it's investigating how good is this assumption of hydrostatic equilibrium? Yeah. It would appear that hydrostatic equilibrium is quite good for this cluster, right? Um, so to be clear, if, uh, hydrostatic equilibrium is not a very good assumption that we would take that to mean that there's a lot of non-thermal pressure support and that the masses we get from effectively assuming hydrostatic equilibrium fall short of the true total mass. And so you would expect that weak lensing mass to be some percentage higher. And roughly, I think the average people are expecting is 20%. But yeah. Certainly, there's a range depending on, well, the state of your cluster. So on average, 20%, but say for a relaxed cluster, maybe it's closer to 10%. And for a disturbed cluster, say one that recently underwent a merger, it could be 30% or more. Okay. Um, hmm. Cool. So... I think before purely moving on to future directions, um, we can touch on uh, Midas versus Minkasi again. Um, let's see. Appendix B just to, yes, Appendix uh, B quickly looks at is there something spurious going on with uh, that entropy profile turning over? Right. And even if we say make an adjustment to the pressure profile such that the entropy profile would continue on that parallel, parallel trend, then we get kind of an odd answer for mass estimates, especially a hydrostatic equilibrium. So even if there is something spurious in our data, it's not as simple as just, oh, that outermost bin was biased low. There's something a little more complicated going on. All right. But then, uh, yeah, figure 14 is a nice demonstration of the difference we get between a Midas and a Minkasi map. Oops, my bad, okay. Yep. And so the top panel shows it as 
as viewed through a transfer function, uh, whereas the bottom panel just shows you basically the surface brightness profile you get for the two methods. Uh, and so the Midas profile there is showing you that ringing that I mentioned earlier. Yes. Basically coming from a common mode subtraction. Uh, whereas the Minkasi profile does not show any such uh, ringing and appears to have a nice curve out to our maximum radius constraint here. Uh, we can also jump to figure 15. And so here we're comparing, I'm comparing the pressure profiles I get when using MIDAS again to the X-ray pressure profile. Right, we saw this earlier. Uh -huh. Well, that was from the Minkowski. Yeah, yeah, understood. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, so the point here then is, okay, if you assume a pressure profile shape like the GNFW, you're doing okay. Uh, but effectively, that's because that shape beyond our or your instantaneous field of view has something assumed. When you don't assume such a shape, you do this non-parametric, you see a clear bias low, basically at our instantaneous field of view. Um, even that bin just inside is okay. starting to get biased a little low. Yep. So, okay. That's just, I think, pretty much expected uh, for that kind of processing that you you don't recover scales beyond your instantaneous field of view. Uh, all right. I, I think with that, I can return maybe to future directions. Sure. So where are we going in the future now that you've got this one, 2020? Yeah. So the immediate future uh, with this cluster, since it's such a deep data set, is to try to look at pressure fluctuations. Ooh. Um, OK. So there are a few studies like this done with x-ray data. And there's a notable one with SC in 2016. So we'll try to follow that. Uh, formalism and apply it here. And so it's a loosely the hope is to look at different regions in this cluster and say, okay, can we find pressure fluctuations that would, by the way, basically it's telling you about how much turbulence there is. Uh -huh. So if you see significant uh, pressure fluctuations or turbulence in the center, that could be indicative that there either was an AGN or is. Um, certainly, we see a point source, so there's some radio emission uh, at a compact level, but has it, you know, disturbed the ICM around it? In the central radii, if that's the right term, moderate radii, uh, we probably don't expect too much turbulence. And then finally, at the outskirts, we would expect turbulence to rise again, be it from accretion shocks, just matter coming on. Okay. Uh, so, right, I, I want to investigate pressure fluctuations in those three regions. Is, is that strictly a question of resolution? Uh, I'd say it's really a question of dynamic range. So you don't Okay. Need, say arc second resolution. I think Mustang two is actually very well suited for this for this cluster. Um, the the instrument specifications match up well. Certainly, if you wanted to, you know, look at pressure fluctuations at a redshift one point five or higher cluster like redshift two. I think the resolution ends up being a bit of a limiting factor, but. <laughs> 
Okay. Sensitivity is also an issue there. Um, yeah, so you, you want a good dynamic range though, uh, because to do this, you, you effectively take a power spectrum within a region. Uh, and then I think another thing that would be nice is, well, we'll be able to account for it. There, our scan pattern has a central weighting to it. So the noise intrinsically in your map is larger at the outside just because you're spending most of your time in the center. Does that make sense? Um, so it's, uh, yeah, if you had a uniform weight map, I think it'd be a, a little bit simpler yet. But those two issues are the main things I'm finding. Uh, go on. No, I was just going to say the future sounds uh, exciting, sounds bright. Well, so. I, I want to add that um, beyond this cluster, I, I think there's a fair bit else that uh, SC, especially high resolution sensitive instruments like Mustang 2, have to contribute to physics of the ICM. Just because, again, X-ray observations can be expensive in low density regions. Uh, SC observations maybe have, uh, are able to contribute a fair bit in the outskirts of galaxy clusters or say in really hot regions. Uh, so either of those regimes say for X-ray cavities or shocks at large cluster centric radii are places where something like Mustang 2 can really contribute a fair bit to constraining the physics. Will there be a Mustang 3? That is a good question. It is uh, conceivable. Uh, it will take a bit of planning to get a uh, team together to put that up. But um, yeah, there are definitely thoughts about what that would look like. Uh, it wouldn't take too much effort to expand the field of view a bit more and improve easily there. Uh, we probably could also add in another uh, wave band. Ooh, okay. and probably we also would want to make it polarization sensitive, which is not so much for SC science, but other science that might want to use it. Cool. Very cool. All right. <clears throat> Charles, I want to thank you so much uh, for taking the time today and walking us through your lovely new paper article. <laughs> yeah. All righty. So thank you, everyone. And we will see you on the next one. Bye bye. Bye, thanks.